This is the fifth estate winning headlines, your media police post coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya, from the Fort Hall School of Government. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you may have missed this morning, but we also take a look at some of the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 7th of July, 2021, and I am 2M. I am CS. And I am Miss K. Again, in case you missed today's headlines, here they are. Raila, my terms for NASA trio. The standard, Uhuru's men turn on each other. And the star, Ruto, Wuing, Lusaka, Weta, and Oparanya. Because these headlines are absolutely boring, I'd like to take a look at what happened last night. Mm. And last night, President Uhuru Kenyatta commissioned five hospitals in Nairobi County. The new health facilities are part of a broad government plan to decongest Kenyatta National Hospital, Mama Lucy, Pumwani, and Mbagathi hospitals. In conjunction with the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, NMS, the government is constructing 24 such hospitals. According to the president, his intention is to give all citizens access to the services they are entitled to, regardless of status and location. The president also said that his government is working to improve living conditions in the informal settlements through the, through the construction of roads, the expansion of sanitation, waste management and water networks, and finally the issuance of title deeds. All of these initiatives are to empower the residents of the informal settlements to build decent homes in the places where they already live. The president was categorical that his administration had reversed the previous policy on demolishing slums, a practice that was done without the consent or participation of the people, a practice that also did not consider the sense of home and the social networks that exist in slum areas. By ensuring availability and access to basic services, the president is restoring dignity to the residents of informal settlements. Yes. Now, before the Twitter warriors of those opposed to government take to their keyboards to criticize this good work, allow me to remind you of the words of Theodore Roosevelt from his most famous speech titled Citizenship in a Republic. Mm -hmm. And according to Roosevelt, a cynical habit of thought and speech, a readiness to criticize work which the critic himself never tries to perform, mm -hmm. an intellectual aloofness which will not accept contact with life's realities, all of these are marks, not of superiority, but of weakness. Mm -hmm. Because it is not the critic who counts. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, striving to do the work. And make no mistake, the president is in the arena. Mm. In keeping with that theme, I turn to the headline in the Taifa Leo this morning, which is thought-provoking, to say the least. And we take the view that we should speak to the thoughts it provokes. It reads... And under that damning indictment, there are photos of the Prime Minister, Kalonzo, Mudavadi, and finally, Janus himself, D.P. Ruto. Janus is somebody who is two-faced. The thought that seized my mind when I read that headline is that the real champion and advocate for Wanjiko, if we are honest with ourselves, head and shoulders above the political fray, is President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. While some people excite the masses with populism, the president is diligently pursuing a multi-pronged, elaborate strategy to both uplift Kenyans and especially low-income earners while also establishing the firmest foundation in the history of our country for an economic takeoff that will be enjoyed long after his presidency. The president's broad strategy includes a four-point framework, and one of the four pillars under this is what he refers to as the restoration of dignity. It is through this campaign that we have seen significant shifts in healthcare provision. For example, before a clinic in Mukuru slums was serving 500,000 residents. As we speak, and as Ms. K mentioned, we are seeing 25 new hospitals in informal settlements that have been built, some of which the president was launching all through last night, well past midnight, while the nation slept. Remember, this is a man who in the last two weeks concluded arrangements to ensure that the entire adult population will be vaccinated free of charge by end of next year. And who in, the, in those two weeks just got back from back-to-back -back trips to, from Brussels, France and Duck, Turkey to secure even more trade deals and investments. And then comes back to launch multiple hospitals across Nairobi until the wee hours of the morning. He is tireless. Yes. Furthermore, as we speak, there are bills in the county assembly and in parliament which are aimed at ensuring that low-income miners pay a lot less for water and for electricity. All the while, NMS is increasing access to water. The net effect of this is that with better sanitation, 
through more affordable and better access to water, you end up significantly reducing the prevalence of disease. And therefore, there's less pressure on health facilities. And in terms of electricity, with more than 75% connectivity across the country, it also means that low-income earners are no longer inhaling fumes from kerosene lamps. Meanwhile, politicians like Ruto, a.k.a. Janus, want to tell us that uplift, uplifting Mamamboga and Buddha Buddha riders means giving them loans. And then we call it bottom-up. Meanwhile, the president, through what he terms big push investments and economic acceleration, is building the markets for Mamamboga to thrive in their businesses in a dignified space. He's building unprecedented networks of roads which will get produce to markets and increase access to opportunities. With 75% electricity penetration, he's providing the electricity that will inch us towards a 24-hour economy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is short-sighted to only argue about putting money in the pockets of Kenyans if you're not investing in the infrastructure and ecosystem that will enable them to derive optimal value from that money. So while Janus and Tangatanga want to keep talking about bottom-up, the president is doing bottom-up, middle-out, and top-bottom. Two visions of leadership. One is a half-baked bad idea. The other is a comprehensive solution. We submit that if we fail to recognize what has been achieved, we run the very real risk of allowing mediocrity and a low-caliber, retrogressive leadership at the helm. If we fail to recognize the pace and standard that has been set and which must therefore be maintained, and we will only realize it when the well has run dry. Hey. Wait. Here at the Fort Hall School of Government, we love to study political specimen. And the political uh, specimen that fascinates us the most is President Uhuru Kenyatta. And that's because he is the least studied politician. Mm -hmm. Whenever he seems out of options, he pulls out a card he did not expect. In fact, when he seems defeated, he comes up with an ace move that completely disorganizes uh, his opponents. We want to compare Uhuru with a grandmaster chess player and his name was Frank Marshall. Frank Marshall often played a game in a lazy or relaxed style that ceded his opponent the advantage. Yet, to counter expectation, the United States champion from 1909 to 1936 never lost. Just when he appeared to be totally lost in a losing position, he would summon up a tactical uh, flight of fancy to smash his unaware opponent. Now, in 1912, a game between Frank Marshall and Stefan Levitsky saw Marshall apply the swindle to the surprise of many in the audience. He seemed to be cornered by Levitsky and was in a losing position. Suddenly, he offers his queen to Levitsky, a move that puzzled many. But in effect, what he had done was to encroach on Levitsky's king in such formation that Levitsky had to resign from the game. Marshall's move was known as a Marshall swindle. What's our point here? What if Uhuru Kenyatta was playing political chess? Uh, what swindle would he play on Ruto? Or let me put it differently. What if Uhuru wanted to lose Juja and Kemba, his queen chess pieces, for a greater goal? What would that goal be? Dissolution of parliament? Government of national unity? Or cabinet dissolution? I don't know. Very interesting thoughts there. We have a three-part criteria that we use to judge the headlines for you. We ask ourselves three questions. Is the headline topical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking, and thoughtful or just plain lazy? Daily Nation, Raila, my terms for NASA trio. Standard, Uhuru's men turn on each other. And the star, Ruto, Wuing, Lusaka, Weta, and Oparanya are all not worthy <laughs> of rubbish. winning headlines. Yeah. Toss them. We have no winning headline. And now on to our final thought, but before we get there, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification button. What is our final thought? And now our final thought, it is inspired by a book entitled The Geography of Genius by Eric Weiner. The Geography of Genius was authored by Eric Weiner, a best-selling author who was a long-time foreign correspondent for NPR. He reported from more than 30 nations from Iraq to Indonesia, covering some of the major international events of recent times. In the Geography of Genius, he sets out to examine the connection between our surroundings and our most innovative ideas. He explores the history of places and walks the same paths as the geniuses who flourished in those settings to see if the spirit of what inspired figures like Socrates, Michelangelo, and Leonardo remains in these places. Why not ask, what was in the air and can we bottle it? 
It is a book about how and why golden ages of genius creativity sprout up at different places and times around the world. He has chosen half a dozen golden ages where there was a critical mass of genius creativity in diverse fields. The working definition of creativity he uses is the ability to come up with ideas that are new, surprising and valuable, the synthesizing mind. Genius, it is observed, clusters in certain times and places. A few examples and insights from the book will su suffice. For classical Athens, the culture becomes creative due to its openness to foreigners and foreign ideas. Once Athenians saw that their culture was arbitrary, they became more open to ideas from other cultures. The Golden Age of Athens occurred after the Persians burnt the city to the ground. The total disruption of the social order helped to produce a new environment where creativity could thrive. For Florence, it had a golden age largely because of the gold florin, in the, which was the first international currency. The Medicis were the greatest bankers and most Im inspiring patrons. Florence had no natural resources and had no standing armies. It used its wealth to pay tribute to its enemies and had to innovate to maintain its standard of living. Finally, an insight which I found fascinating. fascinating. Pope Julius II chose Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling by adhering to the Medici philosophy of patronage. Choose someone who is talented, but give him an impossible task for which he seems like a bad fit. This is the exact opposite from the selection of job applicants today. What does that say about creativity? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I like that. Uh, but I also really like the, the part on the road to genius. And this, this is hearing is that genius, uh, that, that genius is we may be inspired by nature, a walk in the woods, uh, a sound of a waterfall, but something about an urban setting is especially conducive to creativity. Uh, it takes a city to raise a genius, that's what he says. Mm -hmm. Buildings were not uh, merely physical entities, they possessed a spirit. That genius Loki, uh, or, or, or a genius of place. Now, paying attention is a first step to the road of genius. That this is here, being creativity cannot be separated from, from its recognition. But even more is a story behind freedom, uh, activeness and independence of a people. People are more likely to reach their full creative potential when they belong to an independent nation, like the ancient Greeks who worked everywhere all the time. They were great workers and great thinkers and preferred to do their philosophizing uh, while on the go. Now, creati uh, creativity levels were consistently and significantly higher for the workers versus the sitters. They still produced twice as many creative responses uh, compared to the sedentary group. It did not take a lot of walking to boost creativity either. Anywhere from about 5 to 16 minutes of walking did the trick. Now, the ancient Greeks did everything outdoors. A house was less a home than a dormitory. They spent only about 30 walking minutes there, uh, 30 minutes every single day. They spent the rest of the day in the agora, the marketplace, working out at the gymnasium or the palace, palestra, the wrestling uh, grounds, or perhaps strolling along the rolling hills. Now, the Greeks did not differentiate between physical and mental activity. Body and mind were two inseparable, inseparable parts of a whole. A fit mind, not attached to a fit body, rendered both somehow incomplete. So are you telling us that in 2020, because we stayed home and were sedentary, we lost a lot of creativity and mm. were a bit more foolish? Uh, absolutely. Though. you got to keep on moving. <laughs> <laughs> the most interesting of the section of the book, w for me, was where the author dealt with three things that I personally am conflicted about, especially because of COVID. Mm. Meetings, <laughs> brainstorming, and idea generation. The notion that putting a bunch of smart people together and having them talk things out can lead to brilliant ideas. In some, this is a thesis, smart people plus conversation equals genius but this it does not always work out that way the author gives an example and I will quote this example he says that President John F Kennedy held a series of closed-door meetings with his closest and smartest advisors and the result was the ill-conceived 1961 Bay of the Pigs invasion of Cuba nearly all of the 1400 CIA trained Cuba exiles were captured or killed and Cuba moved deeper into the Soviet orbit it was one of the worst foreign policy blunders in American history. And the question was, how could it have happened given the combined intellectual throw weight gathered in that room? 
a psychologist named Irving Janus, don't think if he's related to Janus, <laughs> investigated the meetings a decade later and concluded that the profound error in judgment was due not to stupidity, but rather to a quirk in human nature. When people of similar backgrounds get together, are isolated from dissenting views mm -hmm. and are trying to please a strong leader, mm -hmm. the result is groupthink. Yes. And groupthink or consensus around a preferred position, even if the position is clearly wrong, they will think that. Yes. Groupthink is a flip side of group genius. Yes. But how do you ensure that you do not fall into this trap of groupthink? That question has no simple answer, but psychology suspects that a lot hinges on a group's willingness to entertain dissenting views. Studies have shown that groups that tolerate dissent generate more ideas and more good ideas than groups that don't. Mm. This holds true even if those dissenting views turn out to be completely wrong. So next time you're in a meeting, whether it's on Zoom or physically, don't be afraid to ask the contrarian dissenting questions because you generate good ideas. It reminds me of uh, the documentary, The Smartest People in the Room, about the Enron scandal, right down that alley. Groupthink. Groupthink, Gemma has an issue. We we'll even get to that, but it's true. Think about it. Today we had no winning headline, and you can don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel yet again. You can find us on your TV screens. We are on Pan Free to Air, Go TV, and Star Times. I'll leave you with a quote on genius by this gentleman. He's called Jog Christoph Lichtenberg, and he says that everyone is a genius at least once a year. The real geniuses, however, simply have their bright ideas closer together. Mm -hmm. Do have a good evening. God bless.